Uh, this is a little bit of what I hope to share with you within the future mastermind called Brand Lab. It's a brand new initiative that we're launching. The tagline that we've come up with is helping left brainers think right in the whole mind, the lateral mind, not convergent, not divergent, but using the entire mind. Uh, what we can do is activate not only the analytical convergent thinking, but what we in the creative space have been doing all this time, doing that uh, divergent thinking, the nonlinear part that allows us to solve complex problems. And there's a really strong reason why we want to do this, okay? And I, I just shared this on a podcast interview yesterday, so it's fresh on my mind. Number one is when we're living in a, a fair system, what we learn in school, where we know the rules, we know the outcomes, we know how we're going to be scored, there's a very clear path towards victory. There's a, definitely a right answer and a wrong answer. We take quizzes and that's how we're graded in life. But what we realize after we graduate school, through high school and through college, is the real world doesn't operate under a fair system. It works under a wicked system. And David Epstein writes about this in his book, Range. And he talks about it quite a bit and why he thinks you, you need to not niche down. But I'm going to hold off on that for a little bit because I don't agree with that point. I do agree with the observation that in the real world, you'll notice that there are certain people who get promotions that are less talented or qualified than you, who are less personable than you. And you'll notice people that are more talented than you who should have a better position, great, better salary, but they don't get that either. And it doesn't compute. It's like it doesn't function in our brain. And the reason is because the rules to the real world aren't there aren't any rules. All of it's fabricated. It's a construct. And so when we're trying to, des to design or solve wicked problems that exist in the real world, we're not sure what to do. And we'll see mavericks or people who are new to industry come in and disrupt it and then capture the entire market share. The example I'd like to give to all of you is this. Elon Musk did something that most people were totally ignoring, which is he outdid what NASA was doing. And he thought of this one pivotal concept, I think, which allows SpaceX to thrive, which is they can't afford to build these jets or these rockets and fly them into outer space and throw them away. So one of the biggest problems they had to solve was, can we reuse most, if not all of the rocket and figure out a way to land it? So using a lot of different available ideas and technology, he puts it together an application that's brand new because he's solving a wicked problem. He's looking for divergent solutions. There's more than one way to do this. And then he revolutionizes space travel, I think, and also was able to get um, his satellite company out there. And so all those satellites that are out there providing internet to you are be because he's able to do this fairly affordably and he can charge NASA and other organizations to launch satellites. So this is what we talk about, like why uh, in, in Daniel Pink's book, um, A Whole New Mind, why right brainers will rule the world. So we can combine the analytical thinking with the creative thinking and put them together. It's a very powerful concept. Now, I say this because there are also a bunch of right brainers here who know how to activate their left brain and can think about like real world problem solving, not just flights of fancy and just be lost in their own imagination. So where we meet together in the middle, I think we find like ourselves in our most powerful way. And if you haven't guessed it, you're here because we're going to be talking about one very small aspect of personal branding or branding, which is style, right? It's the most fun that we're going to have because it's the actual application. And it's just a subset of the personal branding stuff. And that's what we're going to do a deep dive in. So here's the first thought I want to share with you today. The earth is covered in water, like almost two thirds of the planet is covered in water, 71% to be precise. So water is an abundant resource that's available. It literally is free because it rains from the sky. You can go to a river or stream and drink from it. You can desalinate the ocean, salt water, and then be able to drink that. There's many ways to gather and collect water. Yet, somehow, a bunch of companies and brands have been able to charge you more for a gallon of water than what you would pay for a gallon of gas. Now, I just did this check recently. So I'm looking at LA, we're paying about $5.37 for a gallon of gas. It's very expensive to buy gasoline in California relative to the country, but not relative to the world. How were they able to do this? Something that's free, that doesn't require nearly the kind of capital investment that it would take to pull crude oil out of the ground and refine it and then distribute it and sell it to you at the pump. How are they able to charge us more for this? Well, there's a little bit more to go to the story. And once we start to unpack this, we'll understand why personal branding, personal style may have more impact than you think. And so the question for you is, 
does packaging matter? So when it rains from the sky, when you can pull it up from, from a well, it's relatively affordable, free almost in many cases. But when you bottle it up and you tell a story, the packaging tells you something and it creates a feeling within you. And I was talking to Michael Margolis uh, in, in a recent podcast. He wrote the book Story 10X. He says that all products have a story. And then I add to that, a product without a story is a commodity. And a commodity is something that we have no personal attachment or uh, w where we relate to, we would never pay a premium for, we just buy it at the cheapest price possible. And there's many things that are in that space. It competes mostly on price because the product without a story is commodity. Now, a while back, a couple of years ago, my friend Joanna Galvao from Gift Design Studios did this Instagram post with me. It was a collab post. And she asked this question, like, do you want to play a game? And so, the, so she splits the screen into two parts to show you the power and impact of packaging. So she asked this question, which shampoo is more expensive, A or B? Which one is more expensive? Just based on what information is available to you. So the shape of the bottle, the materials, the color palette, the topography design, does it communicate something to you beyond what's inside? For all we know, one is superior to the other in terms of ingredients, in terms of testing, uh, how it was uh, 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 ethically produced without harming animals, et cetera. But we're just looking at the package, what we can see from a few feet away. So hopefully you all have come to a conclusion. And she gives two more examples, but I'm gonna just share one more here. Which coffee is the strongest or stronger, A or B? A or B. And we're just looking at the design. Now, what she goes on to say is, did you notice that in both cases, it's the exact same logo, it's the exact same copy, not that you can zoom in and see it. And the rest of it is impacted just by design. So we're saying the contents can be the same, the logo can be the same, the copy and the messaging can be the same, but how design can impact your perception of it. And so Jessica, uh, what did people type in since I'm not able to look at everything at the same time and still keep my focus here? Did most people vote A in terms of the shampoo is more expensive? Can you let me know? Are people saying A? All right, I don't know how to do this, okay. She's saying A, thank you very much. And then before I lose track of where I'm supposed to be here, and then which, which coffee is stronger, A or B? <clears throat> what did they say? What did our audience say? Let's see if they're paying attention this morning. They said A again, okay. Now, Joanna cheats a little bit because you notice something, and I just realized this recently as I was putting this together, is that A has context too which is kind of an important clue. Whereas B is just on a plain background, there's, so there's no context. So she adds these stones that seem to be in balance, and I don't know what's in the background, but there's another cream or something. So it feels like it could be in a spa or salon, some kind of meditation retreat center. And so that's also telling the story. So context, package, design, do seem to make an impact on perception, right? Again, here, She's cheated a little bit in adding the starburst behind the morning blend coffee on the left. And she's got pieces of coffee beans exploding out from the center and a bunch of beans spilling out. And again, she's adding additional context. What have, would have been really interesting to compare left to right is if they're in the exact same shape, but just different graphics and materials and colors, if our perception would be the same conclusion. I think it would be, but there we go. So, the, so I have to ask you this question. This is a, a poll for the audience right now. Does packaging influence your perception of quality, of taste, and of freshness? Yes or no? Go and type in Y or N. And uh, I'm afraid to click on the live stream because I'm, I'm afraid it's gonna give me double audio here, uh, but I can see that, okay? All right, just give you a second to type in your answer. And I think most of you are going to say yes. If you're not being stubborn, if you're, you're just not being obstinate right now, you're gonna say yes. And why is that? And we're not even talking about like what's inside yet. It's just the packaging. Well, in his book, Seth Godin writes about this in his book, All Marketers Are Liars. And you can see that 
All marketers tell stories. It's because the marketer and the consumer are in a pack together. We're complicit in the lie. Marketers tell you that this beer will taste better, it's stronger, or this soda has fewer calories, or the steak will be tastier, or these beans are fresher, whatever it is. And they tell us this through packaging and through conditioning and through context and social cues, and we buy into it. We taste the wine before it enters our mouth. Just by how we hold it in the glass, how it's poured, how it's presented. If it's a white glove thing, if somebody has you smelling the cork or allowing you to swirl the wine around in your glass, we, we taste it in our mind before we actually put it in our lips. And this is what happens because we are always filling in context and story absent details. It's how our mind works. Okay, so this is a, a clue as to how branding and personal branding works. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, in terms of definitions, brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. It's not what you say it is, it's what they say it is. That's from Marty Neumeyer. My friend, Dr. Christine Luster says branding is impression management. So you can't control how people feel about you, but you can definitely influence it by managing the impression. The classic example is when you go in for a job interview or a first date, you're going to be paying a little bit more attention to how you present yourself, your, your body language, that firm handshake, whether or not you look at them in the eye or not. You're trying to manage the impression. You're trying to make a very good impression. It's also why realtors dress a certain way and they drive certain cars because maybe you'll feel less confident when the realtor drives in a car worse than yours. It's part of the cues that we pick up on. It's part of the packaging and the experience. And we need it to be consistent with the way we see it in our minds. So branding creates preference. It builds an irrational emotional connection with the consumer and the company. And it is said then, you can measure the value of a brand, the ROI, the return on investment, is how much more someone is willing to pay a premium over a cheaper alternative, a commodity. So we can buy uh, Folgers coffee, or we can buy Starbucks coffee, or we can buy blue bottle coffee, and the amount in which we're willing to pay for the cheaper alternative is the value of that brand. And it's important to note this. This is why some companies are able to be so profitable, like Apple, like Mercedes, like BMW or Porsche, because they've already won the battle for your mind and your heart. Because when you buy that car, you've already told yourself this story about someday, I'm gonna make it in life, I'm gonna show everyone who doubted me that I amounted to something. It's not anymore about the car. Back to Marty Neumeyer in his book, The Brand Flip, he talks about this. We no longer buy products, we are joining tribes, we're searching for meaning, we want to form our identities and the things that we buy and use. And Ana Lape said that every dollar that you spend is a vote for the world that you want to live in. So when we pay money for one kind of company, we are supporting them literally with our money, our finances. And in secret, maybe we're hoping that their competitors go out of business. So we're all voting in one way or the other by our money and our money speaks loudly. Okay. So hopefully you're along with me in terms of like what it is I'm trying to share with all of you, that there is a real return on investment in branding and potentially even a greater one in personal branding. Let's get into that. So many of you are going to ask me, so how does this apply to personal brand? There's no packaging, Chris. There's no context. What is the messaging? What is the positioning here? Well, let's see how this works. Okay, now my friend Rich did not agree to this, but I'm gonna subject him to this anyways. I told him I've shared this and I'm, I'm gonna keep sharing this until he and I are gonna work together. We're actually working together. I'm just kidding around there. So what I wanna do is just test. When you're in a public space and you meet people in the real world, you're gonna see somebody from afar. So maybe it's like 30 foot view, like we're 30 feet away from my friend Rich and we're going to make assumptions about him just like we did with the shampoo just like we did with the coffee. So I want you all to guess, if you don't know who Rich is, what is his occupation based on how he presents himself? He has a lot to, <clears throat> excuse me, he has a lot to offer the world. He's an incredibly warm, generous guy. A guy that you wanna have next to you in tough situations. 
That's him. That's his essence. But here he is with a backpack, a t-shirt, uh, some pants and some sneakers, nondescript hat. What is his occupation? Okay. All right, Jessica, what are people writing down? Uh, help me help me monitor this. I'm going to do something crazy right now. I'm going to actually join the live so I can see what the comments are. So hopefully I don't get an echo here. I'm going to hit pause right away. There we go. So no audio. Boom. I can do that. I can play. I can see now. Oops. What the heck? I said no audio. All right. Okay, creative backpack has a laptop, outfits casual, could be a trainer, some sort of creative line, a nurse, I like that, Abilash, tech maybe, tech developer, life coach, a virtual assistant, a VA I believe, that's what that means, computer engineer, videographer. There's a lot of wild guesses going on here. Okay, this is awesome. All right, so we'll see how right you are or potentially how wrong you are. Let's go back to the deck here, okay. So now we're gonna zoom in a little bit closer. We're gonna say we're about three feet away. We're a little bit farther than three feet, but I don't wanna get that close to his mug just yet. What do you think his backstory is? Now you can actually see the logo on his t-shirt. It's a Rucka t-shirt. And that might give you some clues. You can see that he's wearing a wristband and a watch of some sort. You can, you can make out a little bit of what's on his hat now. Maybe the materials and the textures. So what do you think his backstory is? Hmm. And then we're going to zoom in a little bit closer. And now we're like right in front of him and we can smell what kind of a deodorant he's wearing or what kind of cologne. Hopefully not the deodorant, that's too close. What assumptions can you make about his character? Again, we've not spoken to Rich. We don't know anything about him. All we know is this is who he is. And we have to make a decision. Do I trust this person? Should I be scared? Should I be afraid? Is he going to pitch me something or is he going to give me a helping hand? Uh, is there something interesting about him that I want to have a conversation with? Okay, so we're going to look at how he presents himself, the clothing, the wardrobe, everything that he puts on in, in a conscious or unconscious way as part of his packaging. So I'm going to ask you this next question. This one's critical and it's going to tie in the first part to the second part, which is, what impact does his packaging have on your perception of the value of his services? So he is a, a professional service provider in the creative space. Does his packaging impact you negatively? Is it neutral, like you don't know, or in a positive way? Like, do you think he's worth more or less or about the same as you expect based on how he presents himself? So we can type in the words negative. You can put a minus sign, equal sign for neutral or a plus for positive. What do you think? The chat got real quiet here. Mm. Is the chat still live? Somebody type in something. So let me see here. I'm gonna type in, is this live? There we go. I know it's working because I just typed that in. I would love for some of you to take a guess, okay? And then I'm going to tell you who he is and what we plan to do with him in one second. Okay, no one's going to type anything because I don't want to judge people, right? Okay, it's probably a good thing. Well, I'll end the suspense. Now, what you may not know about Rich is he's a Marine. So he's ex-military. He's a veteran. He served his country. Um, and he used to fly Apache attack helicopters like this or be part of the crew, Okay. So here he is. He's also a podcast producer. He's an entrepreneur. He runs a small company. Uh, he's also a videographer. He shoots video and he really believes in physical fitness. He's athletic and he takes working out pretty seriously. If you follow him, you'll know this because <clears throat> he's in the gym at five in the morning doing his military thing, getting up early, putting in his reps. And he works with some pretty high level A-list clients and helping them to grow their podcasts. So for Rich, it, he didn't ask me for this, but I'm like, Rich, it's time for a makeover. And uh, I'm a heterosexual, but I'm gonna do my best. We're gonna do a little hashtag fashion 911 and get into it, okay? And I'm gonna show you how my mind thinks and why some of this may matter and how it impacts you. So I know a little bit about him. And uh, you know, without his permission, without any guidance from him, I'm just gonna help to make him over a little bit. Like we went shopping together virtually, which we'll do in real life. And I think 
a person who's fit needs to wear clothing that's slim, that's tailored and fitted so that it accentuates their, their silhouette. And this is really important. And it just so happens that clothing that is designed with a military design in detail are also quite fitted because you don't want a sloppy looking person in service. And there's a couple of companies that make clothes that follow these ideas, one of which is G-Star, another one's Alpha Industries, which literally makes clothing and gear for the military, the armed services, and some that, that don't but have a look like that, like Stone Island. And I want to share a little bit more about these other brands in a little bit. But since he's athletic, works out in the gym, there's a couple of brands like Army, uh, you know, ironically, because he's a ex-Marine. Nike, ACG, All Conditions Gear, Adidas, Terex, and ASRV, so that he can look sharper even when he's working out, running between meetings. <clears throat> so the look should be multifunctional, it should be versatile, and there should be a fitted military detail in there for me, as they were, we're doing a makeover for him. And I apologize, I don't know anything about fashion for women, really, so I'm going to stick to what I know, which is men's fashion. And so you can take these same concepts and you can apply them for women. I just know where I'm dangerous and where I need to keep my mouth shut. Uh, the sneakers here are a collab between Converse and Ambush. I love collaborations between well-known brands and smaller, more independent brands because it takes the best of both. It takes the manufacturing and the distribution of a big company and the idea and the progressive nature of smaller companies and brands and it puts them together. So this is the classic Chuck Taylor silhouette, but it's done differently. It's this black on black thing. It's a beautiful looking shoe. I regret not being able to get this drop. And it just so happens that I was in New York City uh, a couple of months ago on an event and I walked by this store and I was like, this is super cool. The display, the logos, the graphics, and it's like Soul Cycle, but they call it Army, like a fitness army. And I walked in just mostly interested in their clothes, not the workout program. And, and, and I found this and it was really cool. So what I would recommend for Rich is to introduce color you notice that Rich is mostly monochromatic. Let me find the wide shot of him here, right here. Monochromatic, very gray. Uh, there's not a lot to draw your eye in. And introducing a pop of color, a POC, that'd be pretty cool. I, I wanted him to experiment with patterns a little bit to create a little more texture and then start to layer things. And so we could sneak in a little bit of color and then add some fine details. These are mesh mesh shorts, so there's a little bit of perforated holes throughout them, uh, naturally because they're, they're for exercise, but including some of those details actually will kick up your game. And I just love the simplicity of the A of the Army logo, and it's a stencil typeface, it's quite beautiful. And then for him to start to get a little bit more sophisticated and work in layers, you see he's a almost a one layer kind of guy, pant, shirt, undershirt, and, that, and a cap. But working in layers gives him more opportunities to express himself to create a more interesting silhouette. But one thing that I just remembered was, instead of wearing a standard watch, why not wear a Bell and Ross watch, which are uh, influenced or inspired by the gauges inside aircraft, considering he used to be around Apache helicopters and, and presumably jets and things of that nature. This would be like a cool thing to do. And the cool thing is they come in black, ceramic black with orange dials. Like how cool is that? So whatever color you pick in your personal brand and style, I recommend that you pick a bright saturated color, but use it sparingly, not to wear head and toe jumpsuit in this bright supernova orange, because it's just a little bit too much to deal with. So colors can be used to accent, but caution all of you, especially if you don't know what you're doing, don't go crazy on color everywhere. A little bit goes a long way, just like my cap, a little bit of yellow in an all black ensemble, really highlight and accentuate each other. And I think there was a wonderful opportunity for Rich to capitalize and, and create accessories that are both functional, but also kind of eye-catching. And there are many manufacturers who make colored headphones. This one happens to be of a company now that they've seen better days called Urban Ears. And they, they used to come in a variety of hues from lavender to seafoam green to bright sunburst, kind of orange to deep, cardinal reds. So just finding a pair of headphones, if you throw those on and you're walking around a space, it creates intrigue. And I'll get into this a little bit more later, but I, I want you to all be very intentional about thinking about how you package yourself 
and how those different things give you an opportunity to play and communicate different ideas to people. And, and so somebody who, who produces podcasts, it would be good for him to wear headphones because that's a signal to other people. Like he's somehow involved with music or sound because he really cares about this. Now, if you don't care about the color, there's some amazing audiophile quality headphones from Master and Dynamic. Sennheiser makes a really great one and Grotto with mixed materials of open mesh over ear headphones, okay? The other thing that he was doing was walking around an event with a DSLR, but he had a pretty basic DSLR. Not this one, different brand, but this is an opportunity too. Now, it used to be 10, 20 years ago, whenever you walked around with a camera, that like a full frame camera, people would freak out. They're like, oh, you're a photographer, you're a professional. But today, because cameras have become so ubiquitous, having a camera doesn't mean jack because everybody seems to have one. And so I want to remind him, and I don't know why, uh, since I've been a child, I've been fascinated with the military, uh, with guns. I don't own any guns. I don't plan on buying any guns, but I just like the look, you know? And there's like a, a, like a tactical precision to it. I just love the layering and just, a, it's a fantasy of mine. And when we start to look into the equipment and the visual language of the military, lots of things start to open up. And uh, I, I happen to pull some more kind of like reference frames for Rich to look at in terms of like outdoor overlanding and the kind of equipment and tools. And so you can see there's a visual language here that starts to give you more context and character to the personal style. So I'm not talking about just the clothes that you wear, but the car that you drive and the graphics and, and all the accoutrements, if you will, the little things that you add to your life that start to communicate to people. And it turns out camera gear, the cages and the things that you, you add as an accessory to your camera provide additional functionality, but it's designed to look very tactical, like military-esque. And so rather than just walking around with a simple handheld, which says, yeah, me too, I'm a photographer just like you, and I'm an amateur, if you were to kit it out with a top handle, a cage, a side handle, a thing for bottom rails, a quick release mount, all of a sudden, you can really stand out. And if you were to walk around holding this camera, shooting people, you'll notice that people will sit up a little straighter and like, oh, well, who are you shooting for? What's going on here? And so the whole idea I want you it, it, to walk away with today is your clothes, your wardrobe, how you put things together and put yourself together, communicate something about you. Now, for a person like me, who's socially very awkward as an introvert, I have difficulty starting conversations with strangers, people that I don't know. And I don't want to be left out of the party. I don't want to be the wallflower who's ostracized in the back. So I wear clothes as a form of invitation to provoke conversation with people. So the simplest trick that you can do is to wear a concert t-shirt or something with a word on it so that people are like, oh, that's interesting. And the extroverted people or the ambiverts in the world will start talking to you and saying, really? Oh, I like that. And it's just a way for us to find common ground or to disagree on something. So I want you to start thinking about clothes is as an invitation, almost like a business card or a package. And rather than you going to a networking function or an event or a party or out in the street where you have to work for every piece of communication that you get, every relationship has to be earned through extroverted energy. If you were just to wear something like this, where people are always asking me like, what's, what's up with the tape and what's going on there? And I leave it as a mysterious thing and we can have a dialogue about it. But one thing I also want people to know is I care a lot about design. I care a lot about aesthetics and it's very important to me. So uh, this is one of uh, like my, one of my favorite songs, uh, American Boy from Kanye West and the line goes, dress smart like a London bloke before he speak his soup be spoke. I love the lyrical wordplay here. And it's just saying that your clothes say something about you. So, you know, personal style does matter. Okay, so people are still listening. Okay, commenting on this. Okay. My friend Yo Santosa from Ferro Concrete, who's a brilliant designer, runs a branding agency. And she said, this is one of my favorite quotes, which is people don't fall in love with corporations. They don't. We don't care. They fall in love with personalities. And this is where we create that preference. So when we talk about personal branding, the big highlight is on the word person. Like, who are you? What is your personality? What makes you different? Okay. And so when we look at companies and corporations, there's a couple of things they all have. A logo, which is a container for meaning. 
The Nike logo doesn't mean anything. The Apple logo doesn't mean anything. It's through all the thoughtful actions and experiences that Apple or Nike creates for you that the logo has meaning. It's a container for meaning. And I think I picked up that line from Kevin Finn during our podcast together. And then a logo usually houses or, or is a, a button, an activator, a beacon to tell us like what's inside. And so we're, if we're buying a product, it's the packaging. If we're listening to something or experiencing something like a car, then it's the entire experience with the materials, the sound of the car, the whole presentation of it that creates that feeling. Underneath all of that is actual the product and the engine, the, the components of the wheels or the rubber of the sole, the canvas or the leather of the shoe itself, the product. So oftentimes we think the product is what creates the feeling. It's not. It's the things that surround the product that create the experience and the memory and the emotions and the story and it's encapsulated in short form in the logo. So when we look at personal branding, uh, you, you can have a logo, which uh, in a different talk, I'll teach you how to make a, a logo for your, your personal brand. And I have some fun exercises for you to do, but not today. You have your face. That is the shorthand for you. And that's why we're so attuned to, the, to faces and we recognize faces. We might forget the name, but you'll, rem you'll remember the face, right? So, I mean, there's a joke. I forget who said this. Maybe it's Simon Sinek, who's like, you never go up to a person. It's like, John, like, is this your face? Like, you remember the name, but you don't remember the face. It's almost always the opposite. Like, I know you. I just, I'm spacing on the name right now. Remind me again, what's your name? So your face is that container for meaning. And then when we talk about your packaging or the presentation, the context and the narrative, that's all in your wardrobe, the clothes that you wear. So you're the product, you know, what you think, say, and do, your beliefs, your values, your interests. But in order to get through that, we kind of make judgments about you based on how you present yourself. If you're bathed, well-groomed, uh, if your face is bright and you have a, a brilliant smile, or if you have dark rings under your eyes, all these things say something about you, including the clothes that you wear. If it's baggy, if it's ill-fitting. The joke is that, that accountants always wear a suit size, like two sizes too big. They, like they shrank inside their suit or something, right? Or people who work out wear a size too small. It's like, um, you could probably bump up that one size. I'm seeing a little bit too much information about you right now. So the part in this conversation that I'm gonna focus on and go deeper in is your clothes, your wardrobe, okay? And how do we start? So Jessica has helped me out by sharing the prompt. And the prompt is this. So if you didn't read the prompt before, it's, it's here for you right now. What three things, three things do you want your wardrobe to communicate about you? And this is really important. And you'll want to spend time thinking about this and you'll write some things down. And some of you are prepared already because you've written answers in the comments prior to us going live. But now that you have more context as to what we're talking about, you, you might describe different things. Now, when I spoke to Rich and I said, what are the three things? I should pull up his message here, but I don't want to do that right now. He described things that don't really evoke a visual or an image in my mind. You know, like there are words and there are words that that create some kind of like visual in your mind. So you want to start thinking about that. Like if you say, uh, I want people to know that um, I'm full of integrity. What does integrity look like? And it's so strange, right? Well, I'll give you my three words as an example. And I thought about this for half a second. So sue me if I change my mind later, okay? I was thinking like, I want you, whenever you see me walking around, wherever I walk around, I want you to think he's some kind of designer. He's made some deliberate choices because no one falls out of bed in that exact combination of clothes and layers. There's just a little bit too much effort to go on for it to feel random and coincidental. Although that might be the case. It's not just because I've grabbed the clean uh, laundry here. I put it together. I also want you to see me and Get this feeling like this person does not fit a specific mold. He's Asian, but he doesn't look like a typical Asian person. He's a creative, but there's something else here. Or maybe he's a business person or he's a keynote speaker. I don't know what it is, but he doesn't fit in the box. He's, he's going to have fun. He's going to push the boundaries. And he might even wear uh, androgynous clothing to kind of mess around with your head. And that's me. 
I, I like wearing clothes to provoke thought. And there is an attention to detail that I want to impress upon you. And so you see those words, at least in my mind, evoke an image. And, and this is how it translates to the real world. So from wearing short crop, what my friends would call diaper pants, you know, with the wallet chain and the off-white jacket or the shirt to the, the, the Ami Paris pants that are uh, like a bull checkerboard pattern, the cigarette, I think they're called cigarette style pants with the scotch and soda ombre sweater and to the woven jacket with the pants, the Japanese pants with wide flared legs and the suspenders, they all are designed to evoke a feeling from you. And it's quite interesting because at the very beginning of my journey, I dress very much like Rich. I wanted to wear a uniform. I didn't want to think too much about it, but the uniform was basically a generic container package for who I am. And I want to say something. I want my suit to be spoke. Okay. So when we get into it and we talk about style, like what is personal style anyways? It's a, it's a confusing concept. So this is a quote from John Preen says, if you keep making the same mistake long enough, it becomes your style. That's right. Just keep making the same mistakes. This happens in art, in design, and also in fashion. So being consistent with your mistakes creates style. So we want to start being much more intentional and conscious of the decisions that we're making so that we're telling the right story and we're making the same mistake. So once I started wearing the cap, sorry, I should have switched the slide there. Once I started wearing the cap and people started recognizing me for it, when I take the cap off, people are like, no, 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 it's not you. When I switch glasses, like, no, no, put the other glasses back on. They're used to seeing you a very specific way. And so sometimes I forget I wear my quote unquote wrong glasses, my home glasses, instead of my show glasses, okay? And in terms of personal style, rule number one, it's called branding, not blanding. I stole that from Brian Collins, I love it. And here's a typographic joke here. And those of you in design will know this. Those of you that don't, don't worry about it. Not worth explaining. Be bold, be italic, but never regular, okay? So all you type nerds, you design nerds, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, I see. <laughs> There's a thumb up <laughs> for that. <laughs> Some of y'all get that. All right. Um, I also want to point out um, something very topical. Recently, Sean O'Malley won the featherweight championship of the UFC. And what's quite remarkable about him is his ascent into getting a shot at the title happened really, really quickly. He's a fairly young guy still. And I think he is one of these unranked fighters who's able to command a championship fight. He jumped past so many ranked fighters. And why is that? Why is that? Well, we start to dissect him a little bit. He was on Dana White's Contender Series, which he features up and coming fighters. And this is how Sean O'Malley used to look in 2014. So nine years ago, it looks like an all American kid, pretty standard, got some tattoos, but he's already rocking his trademark signature pink shorts, right? And so this is Sean O'Malley just nine years later. Crazy hair, glasses, open shirt, uh, got, the, got the bling, the chain, got the tats now. And, and oftentimes, well, I'm sorry, here, here's a reflection here. 2014, 2021. Okay, something has changed. And people are saying like, yes, what's changed? He grew eyebrows. He used that money to buy some eyebrows. That's not the case. I think he just uh, shaved his eyebrows as a day or something and took a picture of it, a selfie. And so people compare Sean O'Malley uh, to someone else who's like a really big marquee fighter, probably one of the best known uh, mixed martial arts fighters in the world, um, Conor McGregor. You can see that they're both wearing their green shorts, tapping into the Irish heritage, plus the tattoos, the big uh, chest piece that they were both wearing and how flamboyant they are in the ring, right? But if you go a little deeper into Sean O'Malley's story, uh, you'll find out that it's probably not the case. And it's just a coincidence that these are both Irish guys, white guys who are dominating, who are commanding so much attention from the public. Now, I'm just curious if any of you guys know who Daniel Hernandez is. This is a picture of young Daniel Hernandez. Had to block out his t-shirt a little bit here. And many of you 
probably don't know who he is. You probably don't even know his 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 uh, better known alter ego, which is a guy named Six Nine or Takashi Six Nine, and you can see that Daniel has undergone a pretty radical transformation from a New York kid who aspired to be somebody who was always pushing buttons to becoming Takashi Six Nine or Six Nine. And this, this guy has the 6ix9ine tattooed all over his body, everywhere. And he started to popularize this rainbow dye haircut thing that he's got going on. And it turns out, surprise, surprise, Takashi 6ix9ine and Sean O'Malley are friends. And to celebrate, Sean O'Malley had 6ix9ine tattooed on his body as a sign of their friendship or what's going on. What you need to know about both of these people is they are masterful at crafting their own personal brand and personal style in such a way that it's impossible to ignore them. And by doing so, they capture the imagination of the public. You either want to see them win or you want to see them lose. But the only thing they can't do is to ignore them. So rule number two in personal branding is if you want to stand out, don't blend in. And the funny thing is, in every industry, no matter what industry, there seems to be a de facto uniform that everybody adheres to. It's the code of conduct, it's the, the, the dress code that we all seem to buy into. And to a degree, I understand that, but there are variations to that that you can break out of the mold. But if you want to develop your personal brand, you're gonna have to do something different. You're gonna have to stand out. And the reason why is because we are uh, biologically, uh, evolve to notice differences. We're su superior pattern processing beings and it's how the human brain works. So when I reference like say pop culture, when Neo's like entering the matrix and he's trying to understand the program, they run the woman with the red dress program. So everybody's walking around, bland, suit and tie, black and white, the woman in the red dress and the blonde captures his attention immediately and distracts him, allowing him to become vulnerable. And so we don't want to dress in a way to be obnoxious, but we want to dress in a way to express who we are. Okay? So when they zig, another zag, you zug. Just go a different direction and you'll stand out and you'll tell a little bit of your story. So if there's something in your culture, in your... Um, uh, in, 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 in where you live, the, whatever it is, draw inspiration from that. So the next question I have for you is, who is your style icon? And we all should have some and we can be inspired by them and draw inspiration so that it informs what we wear. So of course, I'm going to have to mention the ageless wonder Pharrell Williams, who is now also the design director for Louis Vuitton, which is incredible because he's the first non-designer that is a design director for Louis Vuitton. And then you think, why? Well, look at this gentleman, the way he dresses and he makes, you know, these Ranger hats popular and look at his neckwear game and look at how he's just taking standard silhouettes and dress code and he's, he's making an edit, an editorial stylistic change that then makes it his own. And then I don't know if you know this and it just is a coincidence that I picked two entertainers T.I. T.I., look at this guy. And you're like, oh, I see. I can draw inspiration from him in terms of like he's wearing like, I think a houndstooth or a tweed jacket or a, what is that called? The Glenn Plaid shirt or something like that. And he's just mixing up classic American style with hip hop culture. And he's blending the two just beautifully with certain accents. I just love it. So he can take um, a plain sweatshirt, like the white sweatshirt and a pair of jeans and add in a couple of Lux accessories and, and have this great haircut and sunglasses and just look super cool. And then there's just non-celebrities that you can be inspired by, especially if you live in a metropolitan area that's coastal. Generally, the coast attracts different types of people and exchange of ideas and fashion and influences will create some really interesting things. So I just take great inspiration from this gentleman on the left, an older gentleman, wearing this felt hat, I think, and then his leather attache, but just the layering, the, the rolled up cuffs with the, the brown boots, so sharp. And the gentleman next to him wearing this suit with 
like a gene bottom. I, I just think it's such a smart pairing combination, tailored, yet a little bit carefree, super stylish. And the unique thing here is the rolled up cuffs on his jacket with a couple of bracelets. Very cool personal style. I'm not gonna dissect all of them, but you get it. You can easily just search street style and type in the city, Tokyo, New York, whatever, and find something. So when you find your style icon, your style con, what is the one thing they wear that complements their unique physical features? What is it? And just take note of that. So what we wanna do is dissect and reverse engineer what works for them. Because oftentimes we try what they do and we're not paying careful enough attention or not paying careful enough attention about our body types are drastically different. So if you see someone who's long and lanky, someone who's like six foot three, but 160 pounds, and you try to wear what they wear and you can't pull it off, like many athletes, it looks weird on you because you're not six foot two and you're not 160 pounds, that's why. So we need to recognize that the suit fits the person, when I say suit, the clothing. And here's another question for you, which is, what is one way that they accessorize that you really, really like? And I say this mostly for men because I know men are pretty clueless, generally speaking, about fashion and style. So this is just me trying to help out the people that are in need. I do realize there are a lot of women who are also pretty clueless or who fall in the trap of dressing like everybody else in the industry, whatever that might be, the pantsuit, outfit, whatever. Okay, so quickly to summarize here, my guide for you is you want to have one statement piece. It could be something expensive and you can splurge on it. It doesn't have to be, but something that's unique, that tells a story. So if you're, you're um, I, I don't know, if you're super athletic, you might include something that references the sport that you participated in. Who knows? Uh, it, like if you are, uh, if you're into like aviation, you might wear some, some goggles or something. I don't know. Whatever your interests, your hobbies, you're passionate about, try to include that as a statement piece that becomes unique to you. You want to start to layer and think about accessories that you can add because at least for, for guys, there's not a lot to work with here. And so adding some accessories like some neckwear, some eyeglasses. Now I met a gentleman who was running security at Neil's event and he showed me his business card. He does private security, a beautiful looking black man, a great facial structure. And I just said, you know, red is your color, but there's not a lot of it here. And he, he lifts up his, uh, his pant leg and he shows me that it's wearing red socks. I'm like, that's cool, but you're not showing enough ankle for anyone to really notice that. You could be wearing a red tie right now. You could wear red glasses. He goes, but I have good vision. He goes, they don't have to be real. They could just be UV coated for whatever reason. And, and they don't have to be prescriptive, but those are opportunities for you. And he's like, oh, you're right. Cause the glasses frame the face and the eyes. And for some people, they, 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 we have this prejudice, I think, that we think people who wear glasses are smart. Not always, we're just nearsighted, okay? And to start to look for your signature color. So I know for a lot of designers, the trope is that they all just wear black and I'm guilty, I wear all black too. It's just easier to like layer stuff, but find a color that works for you and start to use that and integrate it. And, and preferably it's a bright, brilliant color. Uh, you don't wanna pick a color that's very muted and desaturated because there's no point in it, all right? And you can do this in layers. Now, I found out uh, from a gentleman that I met in Amsterdam uh, that he wore layers beautifully. And I was like, man, your, your layer game's on point. He goes, the trick is you just buy it all from the same manufacturer because the tones work together. They're designed in, a, in a, like, a, like a system which I didn't realize. So if you buy clothing from a store that you love, especially if you're a little bit clueless and you wanna start leveling up, just buy multiple things from them that can be layered on top of each other. The colors and the materials and the cut will complement one another. And so that's how you avoided the problem, like how do I layer? And, and start to take some chances, everybody. Think about patterns and textures so it's just not one solid blank on you. Break it up a little bit. And that's an advanced level maneuver. So it's not for the faint of heart, but introduce patterns and textures. All right. Now what I want to do is talk a little bit about the silhouette. And there's a quote from um, one of brilliant, uh, 
Britain's like most brilliant fashion designers in the last, I don't know, 20 years, unfortunately he's passed, Lee Alexander McQueen, he says to change the silhouette is to change the thinking of how we look. So many fashion designers are always looking at the silhouette. How do we change the silhouette? There's the human body. What else can we do to it? So they'll, they'll play around with collars or shoulders or, uh, or making the sleeves extra long or the pant legs wide or short, narrow, whatever it is. So they can, they can play around with the silhouette. And you can see the same principle being applied in the world of animation. So when they design characters for an animation, this happens to be for Kung Fu Panda, you can see each character clearly has a different shape and proportion from the crane to the panda to the tiger to the snake to the mantis. They all look so different. And the reason being is we need to be able to quickly identify who they are purely based on the shape. So what they'll do is when they're designing a character sheet like this, they'll just work on silhouettes and not even about the detail. And so you'll notice the crane would normally have a small head, but by giving the crane this kind of straw hat, they can change the silhouette. And that's a pretty cool thing that they're doing there. Okay, you look at the silhouette and we're gonna do this little kind of mental exercise and add a pop of color here, everybody. So I'm gonna show you what that might look like. All right, so here we are. We're just blending in, we're fitting in that uniform and there's not a lot that we're doing here, but I wanna show you how by adding just a pop of color to the silhouette, we start to change how we perceive it. So right now, it's a monolithic thing. It's just one entire silhouette. But if we were to say pop some red socks on, you'll notice now they are going to look very different than everyone else next to them. If we add some red glasses, as I mentioned, all of a sudden we're adding things at the top and the bottom to create visual interest at the top and then anchor it in the feet. And if we add a cap, and we turn it sideways like this and we add some color to it, Again, we just changed the silhouette. We, we drop on a t-shirt with a red X, so it's not too much red yet. It's gonna get really close to adding too much red, but I think we can still manage this in terms of a pop of color. And if we add a red watch band, I think this is a pretty complete look. And we've not drastically altered the silhouette, except for with the cap, it's just with a pop of color. And these are powerful things. And when I mentioned Rich earlier, when he's walking around, he has an opportunity to wear headphones that are synced with his color, his brand colors that allow him to signal to other people he does really care about sound and sound quality, okay? So when you look at how you can upgrade your game to have a signature or, or a, like, a, what, did, what did we call this here? I forgot my own terminology here. One thing that you can splurge on the statement piece. And your statement piece for guys, the easiest thing to do is buy some designer sneakers. Something that's cool that you like, forget what other people like, just buy what you like, and let that be a staple of your new ensemble. Uh, to break up the silhouette, especially if you're like me, you have a shiny scalp, you'll probably wanna wear a hat, uh, some kind of cap or beanie that's got a cool look for you. And you, you're gonna make sure because all our faces are very different. Some are angular, some are wide, some are narrow. Not every hat works with every face, just like not every pair of glasses works with every face. You can also change it up. I like wearing scarves now or a handkerchief or an ascot, uh, a tie instead of a, a, a bow tie instead of a tie. It's, that's a level up maneuver there. Uh, it's an old school detail. Uh, you can wear a necklace, uh, some jewelry. You can accessorize with bags and backpacks and and um, what do they call those shoulder bags, things like that, sunglasses and eyeglasses, and even tools, the things that you use can start to create a story narrative around you, the package, if you will. And the way we start all of this is we begin with a mood board. We, we collect assets that we like, things that inspire us, and I'm gonna give you some clues on how to do this because I asked Rich to put together a mood board. He practically freaked out on me. He's like, Chris, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm gonna just gather things, man. Put things together. And then I realized the thing he gathers are from the world that he knows. And so they're just piles and piles of like not interesting stuff to me. So look at your culture. If you come from some other place, draw from that and draw from art, music, and movies. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but I watched the Ralph Lauren documentary. And it turns out he was really fascinated with cinema and the wardrobe and fashion within cinema. So the great spaghetti westerns became the inspiration for a lot of his Ralph Lauren line and more specifically his double RL brand. So he's pulling from 
from from movies like maybe the great gatsby or maybe it's some post-apocalyptic thing that you draw inspiration from it doesn't matter just pull it out and the and one of the great resources or places you go to is pinterest you can type in a couple of key words and go down that rabbit hole and start saving images don't worry whether it's good or bad just download everything you can decide later and here's one thing that you can do you can type in a designer's name plus runway plus year because you want to get a complete look not just a piece how they put things together on runway shows or lookbooks shows you a very thoughtful considered approach to dressing someone top to bottom and they put them in fanciful situations these kind of fantasy scenarios like going on a safari or going on a, on a trip for a weekend or sailing on a boat or something like that now you don't want to grab all their accessories because you're not going on a boat tomorrow but their ideas to work with and to be inspired by so just to help all of you all out here i don't know what the female equivalent to this but i know at least for some guys if you're a j crew person i would strongly consider or encourage you to consider todd snyder he's an american designer based out of new york often featured in gq magazine uh, multiple collaborations with other designers himself and so this was the the runway look from his collaboration with ll bean so ll bean is a traditional american outdoor outfitters uh, for like people in uh, backpacking, outdoors, and also fishing gear. And I went to the L.O. Bean catalog to try and find some of the clothes. And they're not cut the same way. They're not using that same editorial eye. So the collaboration between Todd Snyder, like a fashion designer, working with a heritage brand like L.O. Bean, came up with some really cool looks. Like those duck boots on the far left with the cardigan sweater with that kind of print. Super retro. I love it. I'm still trying to build this exact same look. Now, unfortunately, I was on my way to building this and some of my clothes, were, uh, my wardrobe was stolen when I was traveling overseas, but eventually I'm gonna be able to build this. And some of you might've noticed that I'm wearing a red like plaid jacket like this one from Double RL, and I'm trying to rock this whole look, right? So there's interesting things that you can pull from, from these runways in terms of like how they put the whole thing together colors, textures, materials, as well as the silhouette. And if you're a North Face person or maybe a Columbia sportswear, I would strongly consider or encourage, I keep mixing up the words there, to look into Montclair or brands like this uh, because they do some very fashionable things. Montclair traditionally provides like snow and ski jackets, uh, very upper crusty things, but to make them more contemporary and appeal to younger people and to make it not just a winter wear thing. They collaborate with some really young up and coming designers. They do this thing called the Genius Project where, where they are really playing around with their assets and allowing young designers to infuse new energy and ideas into it. And if you're into like tech streetwear, strongly I encourage you to look at acronym. They're kind of pricey, hard to get, but Aerosyn Hugh is a master. He's the godfather of technical apparel. Many years working with Nike ACG, Stone Island, and Burton Snowboards has led him to his own line. He's been doing this for decades now. And so some really interesting, unusual things about his clothes. Hella expensive, hard to get. If that's your jam, do it. I just bought my first pair of uh, acronym pants and my wife's like, what are you doing? What did you pay for this? Are you buying into all the hype? I guess I am. All right, if you're a Levi's person, like an all American thing, consider Ralph Lauren's double RL line and the looks that he's able to put together, super inspiring. If you wanna be inspired by this kind of look, like the Peaky Blinders look, just go to a double RL flagship store. I went to the one in Tokyo, man, everybody there was dressed to the nines with all the layers. I just wanted to buy their entire ensemble, but you know, everything from the pocket watch and, and up from the scarves and everything. So when you see me walking around looking like this, you're like, yeah, I now know where Chris gets it. So as you can see, my interests are rather diverse. It's not just a uniform for me. I like playing around with different clothes to match my mood or where I'm going. It's also just kind of go against the grain, if you will. And if you're like a surplus thrift kind of person and you're looking for those kind of military details, one of my favorite brands, Dutch brand called G-Star. I think Pharrell Williams now owns a part of it or owns the whole thing. But G-Star takes inspiration from the military and puts it into their clothes, designed really well, a little bit pricey, but relatively affordable. So if you're into denim, uh, if you're into this kind of pseudo-military detail, you cannot be G-Star for that. 
And, and lastly, if you're an athleisure person, uh, I like collabs. So the Gucci and the Adidas collaboration produce some amazing silhouettes and different looks. Now, for the faint of heart, you're going to freak the F out when I show you this. But I just love how they're putting stuff together. It's something that I aspire to be able to rock without feeling hyper self-conscious. Like the fact that they've got trainers on underneath what looks to me like a skirt with a suit jacket and with a soccer or, or a football gloves on. It, to me, it's just so bold. I just like that. These oversized gloves really change the silhouette. Okay, not for the faint of heart, but just super cool. If you want your drip game to be on point, hard to go wrong with the Gucci Adidas collection. Be prepared to drop some serious coin though, because uh, we're talking about thousands of dollars per piece. So what you want to do is collect all these inspirational things and start to curate them, put them together. And this is the mood board, right? So on the bottom middle here, you're going to see this fairly athletic looking person with a gray suit jacket with a uh, pretty high uh, trouser legs. So they shown, shown a lot of ankle. That's LeBron James. And LeBron James has the build, the height and the frame and his suits are super tailored to his body. They fit like a glove. But for me, since I'm a designer, I love things with well, like good set typography. So the Nike SF1s on the bottom right, the goddess designer. Plus, I just started to recently explore the world of luxury goods, introducing a little Louis Vuitton, and of course, the aforementioned acronym and Todd Snyder. So what you do with this is if you're able to clip some of your favorite looks, what I would suggest that you do is to print them out Go, a little, go do a little shopping until you can build up enough pieces. One piece, it won't work. You have to have layers and you have to have components that work together. And then what I do is I would tape these things to the mirror or to the door where my wardrobe is. And so when I'm getting dressed, I'm like, okay, that's how you wear that. I'm gonna look for something. And after a while, you won't need this at all. You'll be able to do this intuitively. Like your own, your, you are your own best stylist. But I'm going to just tell you this. If you're going to go through this exercise, if you're still here an hour and some odd into this live stream with me, it means you care. And don't take a timid step forward. Take four steps forward, everybody. Okay? The last thing I'm going to share with you, there's a way for you to do this that uh, may be a little bit more analytical for some of you left-brainers there, to develop a style slider. And a slider helps to dial in more nuance definitions of what you're trying to go for. So maybe you're more rock and roll or maybe you're more hip hop or somewhere in between. Like that collab between Run DMC and Aerosmith back in the day, the original collab, right? Maybe you're more vintage or maybe you're more avant-garde. And you can slide this and use different words, whatever works for you, solids to patterns, muted tones to bold colors, uh, more formal versus casual. Figure out the dial here and you can start to figure out what brands align with this. And that's just to help you. And so to try to like bookend this entire conversation as, as I'm about to land the plane and potentially answer some questions, uh, this is me propping Jess to get ready for this part. Remember before we talked about packaging and packaging tells a story and if there's no story, it's a commodity. Well, we don't have to be the same package. We don't have to say the same story. I prefer us not to. You have to ask yourself, are you going to be this standard generic bottle of water that has no story or maybe you're like Voss or the darling of the moment liquid death each one says something about you and when people choose to work with you or choose to buy your products and services they want to join your tribe okay I'm going to share some resources everybody especially if you're new to the world of fashion I'm doing my personal deep dive because I'm planning to launch my own clothing brand in a little while here uh, some of the books here. So you just take a screenshot of this and you're set. Okay. And, and I'm going to turn this over to my, my co-host, the person who's running this in the background, maybe my director producer, just to do some things. But I want to thank you all for spending some time with me. Um, and potentially some of you are very curious about Brand Lab. It is designed for left brain entrepreneurs who want to think right, who want to introduce creativity. And I, as your host and your brand master, so to speak, want to invite you to play with the crazy kids, to eat some crayons, to color outside the lines, uh, come into the light. It's awesome here. And I'll open up to some Q&A now. Uh, as you can see, you see the yellow stripe, even though this is not my design, 
it's all intentional, right? Like I'm trying to design things. I'm pointing the wrong direction. Where am I pointing? Uh, whatever, you know where I'm pointing, okay? And that's my time. I'm gonna do some Q and A now. I don't know how this works, Jessica. So it's time for us to stop the share, right? So how do I do that? I gotta get back here, stop, stop screen. Okay, woo. Jessica, what do we do now? Besides play the music and get us out of here. Hello, hello. So one question that I thought was really good that came up a little bit earlier okay. is about knowing yourself to mm. even get into your style. And a lot of people don't necessarily even know who they are. So what would you say as far as just exploring that part of you? Mm. As you asked the question, I should not drink from my bottle <laughs> of water as I'm about to spit all over the place. Okay, you're right. Some of you who are fairly new to our content and what it is that I'm doing and haven't seen me speak or haven't attended a workshop, maybe this is a little bit overwhelming for you. And, and I guess that's kind of on purpose. So what I need to do is to teach you some other exercises to, to get in touch with who you are. And it's a very difficult journey to go on, so it's not going to be easy. But one of the things I talk about is finding your two-word brand, the, the two or three words that summarize who you are as an invitation to the world to get to know yourself, get to know you better. Like for me, I'm a loud introvert. Uh, for Phyllis Strouder, she's the brand mother. So she took two words and put them together, branding and grandmother, and created the brand mother. Um, uh, uh, Sean, who was a part of the workshops, his, his two word brand was hope dealer. And I love that because he took like a Coke dealer and he made it hope dealer and he works in, in real estate. And so it's kind of fun to see people coming up with a two word brand. So I, I can't explain it right now and do it any real justice, but look out for content from us. My plan, Jessica, and it's part of our larger mission of educating a billion people is, and it was confusing to me before, but it's clear to me now what we need to do. The confusion came in that if I give you the content away for free, will you show up to the workshop? Will you buy the course? And then therefore we have no money. Uh, I have no staff. We can't build a company. And that's not a good prudent business thing to do. But it goes against my nature to want to give and to share with people. So the current plan right now is everything that relates to personal branding. I just want to teach you for free on social media, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and everywhere else, everywhere else you can find me and YouTube, obviously. And then you can just watch and you can learn and you can do the exercises on your own. So now, now we're going to be out in the poor house, Jessica. So uh, don't go buying any fancy car, any luxury goods, right? Shut it down. Shut it down. <laughs> Cancel the credit cards. Put a freeze on the account. Now, I'm just kidding. So the way that we're going to do this is we'll teach you for free. And for those of you who want to go down the rabbit hole, if you choose the red or the blue pill and you want to go see how deep the rabbit hole goes, as Morpheus says the Neo, then I invite you to join me in my brand lab. It's an exclusive group of 100 people. It's a creative think tank where I'm going to leverage my 30 years in working the industry as a person who's worked in advertising, making music videos and commercials for some of the biggest brands in the world, like, like Nike, the afore, aforementioned Nike. Uh, I'm gonna make myself available to this exclusive group of 100 people to give them what I think is what I can, the most valuable thing I have, my time, my attention, my access, but also critical, tactical feedback to help you get clarity in what it is that you're doing. Now, when I talk to Neil, he's like, Chris, whenever my community shows up, they're a little confused about what they're doing. So when you're that confused, it's like, we don't know where to start. And they get into that um, analysis paralysis mode. So it's often helpful for people, like once they're like, this is our target customer, this is our identity system, this is our voice and, and this is our positioning. The content creation part, the marketing part, the telling of our story becomes super, super easy because you get that kind of laser focus. We call it a, the anti-fog. We're gonna provide you some of the anti-fog spray on your personal brand. So if you're looking for feedback, if you're in the position where, I don't know, you're going to do a rebrand and you're about to hire a design firm to help you with that, this is not a service thing I'm providing and you need guidance so you're not spending your money foolishly, if you're gonna go out and redo your whole wardrobe and drop 5G, 
you might want to have some guidance in that process. And I'm here for you, for those that are willing to do that. Now, time, my time is a premium. I, I can't do this normally, but I thought, and we, we conspired, Jessica, myself, Ben and Carrie Green have conspired to figure out a way that I can do this. So it still works financially for me, but then you get the feedback. So the Brand Lab is weekly calls mostly, not all the time, where you can drop in and be, be part of the, like the hot seat coaching where we address your problem and I'm just gonna sit there and I'm, like, I'm gonna pour into you. So if you wanna pull up your website or your identity system or even bids or proposals that you're seeing from other people about your marketing, your content game, I can help look at it, I can guide you along the way so you can make smart decisions, so you can amplify your influence, grow your authority, and to further and deepen your mission. That's what I'm here for, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who goes to the sales page, which you're gonna see the link right below us, somebody who goes there and maybe it's not a fit for them because it is going to be businesses that are at a certain stage so that they can yes. benefit the most. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Pro so that they know yes. there's personal branding work that's still available? Yes, so what we try to do is be very thoughtful in the uh, the the journey of all entrepreneurs, whether you're left or right brain. So we have three tiers and this is how we can serve all our community. So Brand Lab isn't us just turning our back on other communities. It's just in addition to, it's not a but, it's an and, all right? So Brand Lab, we're, we're targeting people that do a million plus in revenue. That's not a hard number, but it's a general guidepost for you and who can afford $18,000, basically $3,000 a month for six months. This is what I'm willing to do. That's a commitment I'm willing to make. There is a tier for people who are between $100,000 to $1 million in revenue. That group is called the Pro Group. We do different things. There's more curriculum. Uh, it's more time invested in you trying to get the help that you need. It's a, it's a lot less one-on-one -on -one attention. Okay, but that group is fairly affordable. It's $250 a month versus $3,000 a month. So you can see there's a big gap there. And then we also have another group called the Accelerator, which in case you're here and you're like, this sounds wonderful, I need help, I'm not there. Accelerator is for anybody who's just starting out, for creative people only, who want to get from zero to $100,000 in revenue a year. Ben Burns, Stephanie Owens has got you. A very specific program that give you direct feedback on your website, your copy, your positioning, so you can build your business. So you can see, we're gonna take care of you from the infancy of your creative entrepreneurship game, all the way into like, you know what? I've made enough money. I wanna do something deep and meaningful, find my purpose and share my gift with the world. We got you on both ends. Awesome, and with that, it looks like it's a wrap. You ready to it's wrap? A wrap. <laughs> yeah, that means I'm going to play the music and get us out of here. So first of all, I want to thank each and every single person who's tuned in, who's stayed with us the entire time. Naturally, the question always comes up. Hey, Chris, is this recorded? This one is recorded. I don't know how it's going to be shared. It could live here on LinkedIn for a little bit. It might migrate its way over to YouTube. Maybe there's like little segments that we cut up. Who knows? You know, we're in the media game. We'll, we'll, we'll figure this stuff out. Okay. So I appreciate all of you for hanging out with me. If you have other questions, just please comment on the live stream and we will be checking it. If you're very interested in, in Brand Lab, just type in the word lab, L-A-B, and the number one, lab one, like you're the number one person here and we'll take care of you, okay? And on behalf of the entire feature team, myself and Jessica, thank you for, for much, very much for being here, everybody. We'll see you on the internet. Take care. We'll see you next time.